Aside from the well-known twelve Olympian deities, the ancient Greeks had many more gods and goddesses. These lesser gods were not considered less important, but rather their sphere of influence was less, and they had to obey the greater gods, who often directed them to do their bidding. Nyx, the personification of night, was considered to be the mother of everything mysterious and inexplicable, such as death, sleep, and dreams. In the Iliad, Homer describes Nyx as the subduer of the gods, as she represses the spirit. She was an ancient deity, usually envisaged as the very substance of the night, a veil of dark mists, drawn across the sky to obscure the light of Aether, the shining blue of the heavens. Her opposite was Hemera, Day, who scattered the mists of night at dawn. Nyx is consistently described as being dark or black, wearing a cloak as dark as she is and a long veil, and is represented as a beautiful woman. Seated in a four-wheeled chariot drawn by two black horses, which she used to travel across the sky, accompanied by the stars which follow in her train. She was a figure of shadows and darkness, so powerful and frightening that Zeus himself was terrified of her, although she also possessed an exceptional beauty and power, to the point that Zeus was awestruck when he saw her. She came into vogue in the 19th century, and around that time started appearing a lot more often in paintings. Nyx is a member of the Protogenoi, the primordial gods worshipped in ancient Greece. She was created by chaos near the beginning of time. She has parallels in most other mythologies. Among these is the Norse goddess Nott. This painting is Peter Nikolai Arbo's visualization of the goddess. Through her marriage to Erebus, representing the personification of darkness, their children were Aether and Hemera, goddesses of air and daylight, evidently a simile by the poets to indicate that darkness always precedes light. Nyx later became the mother of many other gods, most famous being Moros, god of doom, and the Charis, gods of destruction. Some other children of Nyx were Thanatos, death, and his twin brother Hypnos, sleep. They lived in the realm of shades, and what is interesting is that when they appear among the living, Hypnos is universally loved and welcomed as their kindest and most beneficent friend, but his brother Thanatos, or Death, is feared and hated as the enemy of mankind, whose hard heart knows no pity. Very befitting of Death and of the Greeks' view of it. However, even though they viewed him as a very gloomy and mournful divinity, this didn't translate into their representation of him, which also matches typical Greek customs and seeing the gods as more beautiful humans. they didn't represent him with any exterior repulsiveness. On the contrary, he appears as a beautiful youth who holds in his hand an inverted torch, emblematic of the light of life being extinguished, and his other arm is thrown around the shoulder of his brother, Hypnos. Hypnos is sometimes depicted standing tall with closed eyes and usually bears a poppy stalk in his hand, which we'll see again when we look at the art of Nyx. A most interesting description of the abode of Hypnos is given by Ovid in his Metamorphoses. He tells us how the god of sleep dwelt in a mountain cave near the realm of the Cimmerians, which the sun never pierced with its rays. No sound disturbed the stillness, no song of birds, not a branch moved, and no human voice broke the profound silence which reigned everywhere. From the lowermost rocks of the cave flowed the river Leith, and the low, monotonous hum of the water also invited slumber. The entrance was partially hidden by numberless white and red poppies, which Mother Night had gathered and planted there, 
extracting drowsiness from their juice, which she scatters in liquid drops all over the earth as soon as the sun god has sunk to rest. In the center of the cave stands a couch of blackest ebony with a bed of down. On this rich couch the god himself lies, surrounded by innumerable forms, chief among them Morpheus, that changeful god who may assume any shape or form he pleases. Nor can the god of sleep resist his own power, for though he may awaken for a while, he soon succumbs to all the drowsy influences that surround him. Morpheus, the son of Hypnos, was the god of dreams. He is always represented winged, and appears sometimes as a youth and sometimes as an old man. In his hand he bears a cluster of poppies, and as he steps with noiseless footsteps over the earth, he gently scatters the seeds of this sleep-producing plant over the eyes of weary mortals. The names of these gods turn up in English words, whose derivation gives clues as to their origin. Euthanasia, for example, is a good, you, and death, from Thanatos, while a hypnotic drug, like hypnos, makes you sleep. Morphine, of course, refers to Morpheus and the ability of sleep to calm suffering. This painting is by John William Waterhouse, completed in 1874, and called Sleep and His Half-Brother Death. Another similar painting is this one, also a notable exception to the rule that depictions of night in art only really came into fashion during the Romantic era. This is Luca Giordano's fresco of Charon's Bark, Night and Morpheus, painted from 1684 to 1686, in the Palazzo Medici Riccardi in Florence, Italy. Here you can see her being ferried across the dead to the underworld, her home. Although there's a lot of vagueness in written accounts about Nyx's home, she's normally associated with Tartarus, part of the underworld, and is therefore an appropriate goddess to be shown with the boatman Charon in this setting. She appears with a couple of owls on her head, the painting's title claims that it is Morpheus rather than Erebus next to her, although Erebus is normally associated with the underworld. Surrounding the couple is a dark blue cloak covered with the stars of the night sky, but there is no chariot in sight. This next part that I'll be reading comes from a blog that I'm going to link in the description below. Night with her train of stars by E.R. Hughes with her dark hair and dress, night flutters through the sky, holding and shushing a baby who scatters poppies into the air. Remember, poppies are a symbol of both dreams and death, and related to hypnos. These poppies turn into a flight of golden birds. She travels through the sky silently, and cherubs cling to the folds of her dress. It looks like another figure of equal size travels behind her, just out of our sight, from the second pair of wings. Night and Sleep by Evelyn de Morgan Night is often accompanied by another deity. Night leads sleep, shelters them, while sleep rains down poppies. In this painting, there is no dark night sky, but night seems to be forming it by holding up a cloak that symbolizes the night sky, and they both have closed eyes. Night leads us, protects us, and we are powerless but to echo its movement. It's like a spell that falls over us, puts us to sleep while we're under her wing. You really can see the personification here. Every aspect of human experience, of nature and of cycles, is personified, typical of the classical tradition and pushed to an even more human, more subjective extreme by Romanticism. Typical of pre-Raphaelite art, both characters look androgynous in de Morgan's work. Night and Sleep by Simeon Solomon When night and sleep appear together, they can appear like lovers. Simeon Solomon's images of sleep and dreams often have them intertwined, echoing lovers in the night, bound by darkness. The Spirit of the Night by Constance Fallot Usually night is a woman, and there is a feeling of protection, of a mother tucking in her children to sleep. Because of the darkness, the deep coloring of the robes, there is also a slight hint of threat. Night covers and smothers, night renders us unconscious, and the poppies speak both of dreams and of death. 
Certain elements of the composition here make night feel neither comforting nor protective, such as the poses, the long black cloak, and the bats at the bottom. She looks more like death rather than night, about to engulf the slumbering young woman. This shows another aspect of sleep, which of course the Romantics took to the extreme. The sexuality of night, night as a seductive nymph, is shown in these two works. Her skin is glowing like the moon, her hair as dark as the night sky. This figure is the flip side of night as mother. The presence of bats reflects the animalistic nature of night, unruly, somewhat demonic. Auguste Alexandre Hirsch made Nix much more romantic in 1875, which must have caused quite a reaction when it was shown in the Salon that year. In 1880, Gustave Moreau painted this watercolor portrait of Nix, surrounded by associated symbols and objects. These include bats, demons, and stars, but not her chariot. Jerome's Night, from about 1850 to 1855, is one of the earliest 19th century paintings of Nix. It seems to have been painted by several different hands and may have been intended as a little aesthetic diversion rather than a faithful representation of the myth. She is shown bearing one of the signs of night in the days before outdoor lighting, the burning brand. The red poppy flowers on her dark blue cloak come not from myth but a later association with Morpheus and sleep, which was made clear in Virgil's Aeneid. In Book 4, line 486, translated, this reads... From thence is come, a witch, a priestess, a Numidian crone, who guards the shrine of the Hesperides and feeds the dragon. She protects the fruit of that enchanting tree and scatters there her slumberous poppies mixed with honeydew. Her spells and magic promise to set free what hearts she will or visit cruel woes of men afar. William Adolphe Bouguereau depicts owls in his Portrait of Night in 1883. These night birds are always shown in dark plumage. There is no role here for the white specter of the barn owl, for example. Night by Edward Byrne Jones and Night by Wilfred Gabriel de Glenn. Night can also appear as a solitary, almost lonely figure, as it can be a time when we're alone with just our own thoughts and feelings. The night of Byrne Jones floats through the air, her face turned away seeing and contemplating the landscape beneath her, unaware of our presence. De Glenn's figure closes her eyes, holding her arms protectively across herself. Night sees no company, no help. She travels alone. Kirsty Walker said this very poetically in her blog. There is no threat, nor any company in the landscape of the night, so why do we feel so afraid? Possibly it is the darkness, disguising the things we fear the eternal anticipation of attack as they remain unseen, untackled. All we need to do is wait for morning, and all can be revealed and relieved. Dawn by Frank Dixie This time night is for once almost recognizably male, and is driven out from his position by the glory of dawn, portrayed as a nice girl, perhaps a little ostentatious. There is nothing dynamic here about night, who looks very sad and weary, walking down from the hill. In terms of the composition, the figures echo each other, her swirl of scarf becoming night's mists. Dawn is proud and seems to be shouting ta-da in a golden triumph of rebirth. On the Wings of Morning by E. R. Hughes So now we come back to Hughes and the coming of the dawn over the landscape of night. Dawn is winged like night, and she is surrounded by a confetti of birds as she flies underneath pink clouds. Below her you can see bats of night turn into birds of day. Her face is definitely one of triumph, day over night, life over death, hope over despair. She, like night, is alone, but she is flying towards something, bringing the day with her, 